Hello, everyone. Here I am with my glass of wine, which I showed you in my thumbnail. Uh, I'm actually not going to drink this because only because I just went out with my daughter for my birthday and we had a lot of mimosas. So no more. But the reason I did this wine glass is because both of these ladies, unfortunately, were out at places where they're meeting guys, drinking, that kind of thing that gets girls in trouble. And this is why I always promote this particular book of mine, How to Save Your Daughter's Life. Because one of the most interesting things happening these days is that now I'm 66 of this as of this birthday. So I can tell you when I went out for the first time to a bar with my sis, who was older, so bad sis. But anyway, she took me to a bar when I was just old enough. We had Tom Collins. And we would buy one drink or we go, maybe if we get lucky, one guy would buy us one drink and we would nurse that drink for like the entire evening. We would try to get through the evening on one drink, nursing it. And it's also kind of interesting because I, I, I learned recently that at that time, um, at that time, <laughs> you, you couldn't actually walk around with a drink. This is cool today. I mean, you can stay on the dance floor and, and drink. Back in those days, you couldn't even leave your seat with the drink. And I didn't really remember that. But thinking back on it, there was probably a truth to that. You left your drink and then you went and danced, which is why then people said, you know, don't do that because, you know, the guy can like throw the roofie in it or something. Um, and I want to point out something. This is something, again, I point out in these books. Girls aren't usually being roofied. They're usually drinking shots. And shots have been a disaster for young women because they're so potent and they're so quick. So you have your drink and then you hit your shot. You have your drink and then you hit your shot. So guys know this. So they love to buy shots for girls because after they've had 10 shots, they're out of it. They're completely out of it. And then you can manipulate them in many ways, uh, bring them back to your place, encourage them into sex, maybe have them fall half asleep and have sex with them. This is where date rape comes in. So I want to point that out to you. Um, oh, and thank you, Annie. <laughs> Annie says, I can hear you. Thank you. I forgot to do my usual, you know, requirement, you know, where I ask everybody if they can see and hear me so that I don't waste your time talking about absolutely nothing and you can't hear me. So um, also somebody else pointed out, oh, thank you very much. Yes. Please hit the like and enjoy the stream. Thank you, Claire. Um, yes, please hit the like. Uh, please do subscribe if you haven't subscribed and please do uh, hit the notification. That's the bell. So you find out about my shows and something I always forget to mention, please do share any, any one of these videos you really like uh, that, you know, you're particularly interested in and you have friends or, or Facebook groups that might be interested in it. Please do share on those groups to help support the channel. So I would appreciate that. So today I did not start out with my usual, you know, my usual video because I actually have a few videos I'm going to show during this show because there are so many, I, I actually talked a lot about this case in the day. And uh, these videos you see, they're going to be somewhat, I think about 11 years ago. And somebody out there, one of my, is going to say, damn, what happened to you? <laughs> you look so good in those videos. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, more than a decade ago, uh, great makeup, great hair, great lighting. I'm not sitting at my dining table, which is where I'm sitting, uh, doing really crappy makeup and I can't do hair. So, you know, and I gained 40 pounds during coronavirus. Okay, you know, I'm not going to look as cute as I did in those videos, but I really want you to pay attention to what I'm saying in those videos because this whole thing about you're on, you're on Vander Sloat, I'm going to say here, you're on Vander Sloat. Uh, a lot of people, and I did myself originally say you're on Vander Sloot because his last name is L-O-O-T. Um, but the I guess the Dutch way to say it is really Van der Sloot. So I think I corrected that somewhere in my in my uh, television commentary. So I'll say you're on Van der Sloot here. So I will do that. But you might hear me say Sloot and everybody else say Sloot in the videos because we're Americans and we don't know how to pronounce Dutch. <laughs> so, but... Um, one of the things I pointed out very early on was what kind of guy is Joran van der Sloot? Um, and before I do that, I'm just going to read you just a very short bit about him and also let you know what kind of guy we're dealing with in general. Um, 
Joran van der Sloot, for anybody who doesn't know the story, he, um, at 17 years old, he became the chief suspect in the case of missing 18-year-old Alabama girl, Natalie Holloway, in the, uh, in the, on the island of Aruba. She went down there for a graduation party, um, was hanging out at a bar, and went off with Joran and a couple friends, and supposedly went to the beach. And then he said, he and his friend said they dropped her back off at her hotel, but she was never seen again. Um, so you, Van der Sloot was the last person to see the young cheerleader alive. Um, Holloway's body was never found and he was never convicted of the crime. And oh, let me, let me. So having said that about Joran Van der Sloot here, um, uh, here is his commentary on did he commit this crime or didn't he commit this crime? Did you kill Natalie Holloway? No. Did you harm Natalie Holloway? No. In a 2008 hidden camera investigation by a TV crime reporter, then 20-year-old Vandersloot admitted he knew what happened to Natalie and said he watched her die. I just think that I'm incredibly lucky that she's never been found. Because if they found that girl, I'm in deep But he later recanted that confession. Vandersloot has maintained his innocence. <laughs> yeah, sure he has. Okay. Um, oh, interesting story about the, 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 when he's in the car and he is saying, you know, talking about her body and he does talk about how he knows what happened to, to Natalie. He certainly does. And the guy who did that interview is a Dutch journalist. He was just shot in the head two weeks ago and he's dead. Um, apparently he did some really good journalism on some drug cartels and Unlike your Jor van der Sloot, uh, they take out the people that, you know, that bring too much truth to light. So, but anyway, you can see he said, oh, and originally he says, oh, I didn't do it. Then he changes the story. Then he says, I didn't do it. Then he changes the story. So Joran van der Sloot is a pathological liar. So let's look a little bit more about him. So after he got away with the, okay, we don't know that he killed Natalie Holloway, but... Sure looks that way. Anyway, he didn't get convicted of that. He went on and he raced around the world doing whatever he wanted to do. Uh, he supposedly trafficked some girls in Thailand for sex trade. He, he, he tried to extort money off of Natalie Holloway's mother, Beth. I mean, not a nice guy, but always into something, always up to something. And then what happened was, this is what the, what the report here says. Then in a bizarre twist of fate, five years later, on the very date of Holloway's disappearance, which is really odd, Van der Sloot was implicated in another international homicide. In a seedy Peruvian hotel after a night of gambling, he confessed to savagely pummeling a 21-year-old student to death with his fists. Prosecutors say it was premeditated murder to rob the young woman of her gambling winnings. Van der Sloot's defense team says it was self-defense and a crime of passion. Yeah, well, okay. Definitely not a crime of passion. <laughs> I can tell you that. Definitely not self-defense. I don't know how. Is it really this girl? He's got to defend himself against her? I don't think so. So, yeah. I'm gonna, so I'm going to talk about what kind of guy this guy is, um, why he would kill two women. Um, and there has to be a personality disorder behind that and then a type of a crime that he wants to commit. So let's take a look at who he is. And I'm going to, before I read you about him, I want to point out um, what a psychopath is. Let me see if I can get out of the way of my own thing that I'm going to put up here. Okay. Psychopathic traits. So let's look at psychopathic traits because, okay, I'm going to say it right up. Joran van der Sloot, absolute psychopath. And look for these traits along the way, glib and superficial. In other words, he just says things off the top of his head. Whatever he feels like saying, he doesn't really, the depth is not there. Egocentric and grandiose. This dude thinks a lot of himself. Lack of remorse or guilt. That's for darn sure. He really didn't care one bit about what happened to these women. He did not feel sorry for them. Uh, he didn't say, oh, I, I, you know, I did this. And I'm ter terribly sorry I did it. Nah. And also that goes with lack of empathy. Got none of that. I mean, well, you know, it's not exactly true. 
uh, uh, psychopaths have empathy for themselves. <laughs> you know? I care about me, me, me. I don't care about you, but I do care about me. I'm very empathetic toward myself. Uh, people never seem to remember that part of it. And also deceitful and manipulative, lying like a dog, ma manipulating people to get them to do what they want. And, and oh, no. oh, no, here we go. Shallow emotions. Again, you know, the girl's been murdered. She's never, she's a young woman. Now he was a just, just graduated high school. And Joran van der Sloot doesn't think, pretty, pretty much doesn't care one bit about her or her family. They're all just a pain in the butt to him. So very shallow emotions. Impulsive, that does say a lot for Joran van der Sloot. He, he has a lot of lack of control. A need for excitement. I mean, he's like the guy, he's like a classic psychopath. He loves gambling. He likes, let's say, running a sex trade in Thailand. He likes, he likes trouble. So he, 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 uh, he loves excitement. He gets bored easily. Poor behavior controls. Well, you betcha, because if he can't control himself with women, he's got poor behavior controls. A lack of responsibility. Oh, he could never keep a regular job. Man, he just uh, had to rip off everybody in order to keep going. And then I want you, I want to point this last one. This, whoops, this one early behavior problems. Mm. So a lot of times what's frustrating for me when, when people will later on say, well, I had no idea he was a psychopath. And I'm always like, no idea. Like he was like the best guy ever, kind, wonderful, hardworking, you know, no, there's gotta be signs. You Psychopathy starts really young. Like you start seeing it at two and three years old. So you can't, convince me that that kid grew up with you for 18 years and you had no clue something was wrong with that kid. But the problem with a lot of moms and dads is they just don't want to admit it. I mean, who wants to admit your kid is that screwed up? But listen to what, listen to this thing about Joran van der Sloot. Because, woo, the people who've met van der Sloot describe him as a sociopath, which is the same thing as a psychopath, uh, a predator. Yeah, he certainly was. Okay, some people call him a monster, but let's look at his, this is his childhood, which I think is really interesting. Juron, the oldest of three boys, had been a sweet child initially. Oh, by the way, sometimes they are sweet in a way, and the reason they're sweet is because they're manipulating you. So, whereas a normal kid just might be, I don't want to do that. This, a sweet kid might go, of course, mother, I'll do that. And then I will do something behind your back that you won't know about. And I want to fool you. So I'll do sweet things. So don't ever believe the sweet story. Um, so he, let's see, where is it? Uh, oh, sweet child initially. His parents enrolled him at an expensive private high school. And so he, no, he, he didn't come from a poor family. This, is, this was a very well-to-do family. He was an accomplished tennis player. And, but exhibited all the sportsmanship of an uglier version of young John McEnroe. <laughs> so he had a temper. Though he shot up to six foot four quickly for a young man, he was still self-conscious about his weight, having been chubby as a child. So despite his comfortable upper middle class lifestyle, Van der Sloot began to show signs of instability in his teens. Now, the teens is when it really shows up because that's when they start wanting, like any teen, to, to have more power more control in life, don't want to follow what their parents tell them to do. They get car keys and things like that, money, and that gives them more power. But probably didn't get enough money because it says here, he stole money from his parents, lied compulsively, and became aggressive toward his younger brothers. The family shrank away from him, terrorized by a young man they couldn't comprehend. He once complained to his mother that he couldn't stop himself from lying. They allowed, they allowed him to go live in an apartment outside the family, mostly because they were terrified of him. <laughs> Meanwhile, drinking and gambling had become serious issues for the teenager. Van der Sloat bragged that he could consume a case of beer and 20 to 30 shots of whiskey. That's probably one of those exaggerated, grandiose, uh, grandiose traits of a psychopath. I'm doubting he drank that much before he gets drunk. And <laughs> this isn't getting drunk. This is before he gets drunk. 30 shots of whiskey. Before he gets drunk. Okay, you're lying, dude. Um, very grandiose of you. He spent most of his nights drinking and gambling in the island's casino. And this is in Aruba. Um, but it says here, and this is very important, uh, especially for date rape issues, um, how to save your daughter's life, just because the guy is cute is not going to save your daughter from him. 
because cuteness does not mean he's not a psychopath. Uh, but cuteness does get the girls. Let me tell you, it does get the girls. It must have been because of his country club good looks or his soft brown trusting eyes. But also the fact he's a psychopath. He knows how to manipulate. And this is an educated psychopath, an educated one. Good looking, educated, well off psychopath. So, it, you know, he has a lot to work with. And he learns how to use that oh, to get what he wants. Um, still, so many people said he had a natural believability to him. And when people like somebody just, just because he's good looking and smart and all that, they like him, they have a hard time believing he's not like the cover of the book. If it's a great cover of a book, they can't believe what's inside is horrific. And so what happened was his mother... Still, his mother sent him to a psychologist, first believing his problems were due to early onset puberty and then to bipolar disorder. By the way, bipolar disorder is a highly overused term which doesn't have real uh, any kind of real evidence behind it. Um, mostly it's a narcissistic tendency that you know you don't quite get what you want, so you go crazy um, and you get, you get highs and lows because you can't fulfill your needs. Um, but then people call bipolar who are actually just plain out psychopaths. And that's what he was. And a lot of times when they go to psychiatrists, the psychiatrist will try to help them. And you can't help a psychopath. So especially if they're teenagers, you want to help them. So you, you do things to try to say, hmm, you know, maybe he's, he's not a psychopath. You know, you don't want to tell the parents that. He's not a psychopath. Maybe he's bipolar. Maybe he's this. Maybe he's that. But we can, we can help him. You know, if he's a psychopath... You can't help him. Um, you just got to get out of his way before he takes advantage of you. Um, Van der Sloot also had a voracious appetite for sex. He lost his virginity at 14 and maintained a steady stream of girlfriends. Uh, his friends from a pu local public school called themselves the Pimpology Crew, spending their nights trolling for female tourists. It's Aruba. You know, girls on the beach in their little bathing suits, you know. Um, American girls... Van der Sloot once said, were the loosest of the lot. And that is a lot of the importance of what I'm talking about. He had an attitude toward women that they were somebody, that, that they wanted him, that they would, be give, they would be willing to give him sex. They absolutely would be willing to give him sex. So this is why I pointed out quite early on, that he's not a serial killer. He's a date rapist with a rage problem. So let, let's take a look at uh, one of the other shows that I did um, about, about Joran van der Sloot at the time. To Peru now, and authorities there say they have incriminating new surveillance video of murder suspect Joran van der Sloot, and it shows him at his hotel with Stephanie Flores the night that she was killed. As detectives began interrogating the Dutchman yesterday, officials released tape of what appears to be the 21-year-old victim following van der Sloot into her room. Hours later, at his room as well, rather, the uh, cameras captured van der Sloot leaving that room, though this time alone. Joining me now, criminal profiler Pat Brown. Good morning, Pat. Good morning, Alex. Let's look at how this video plays into all of this. Are there conclusions that can be drawn from the video? Oh, that videotape is just great. And I think you're on the lawyer who came on television the other day and said, oh, you know, we're just jumping to conclusions. Well, let's look at it very simply. You're on and the girl go into the room. You're on comes out of the room. And if somebody doesn't go into that room between, you know, after he left, there's nobody else who could have, could have killed the girl unless you've got a ghost out there. So I think that's pretty much uh, locking him in. Uh, it's going to be great evidence in court. It doesn't look like he did a lot to cover this up. <laughs> I mean, he, he knows there's video. I mean, he's the last well, five years. Let's face it. Knows. Maybe he's stupid and never paid attention to what hotel he was staying at. Well, you know, <laughs> never actually, noticed the cameras. Or could it be that he doesn't care after all these years? I mean, think about his life the last five years. A lot of people right. are not going to have sympathy for him in the least. However, it can't have been a picnic. Well, I, he's too, he, no, actually, I don't think Joran has a problem with his life. He, he, he enjoys what he's doing. He likes getting all the attention. He likes traveling around the world mm. and doing whatever he's been doing. But actually, when it comes right down to it, I think here's the thing that people aren't getting. They, a lot of people are saying Joran van der Sloot is a serial killer. That's going all over the news now. He is not a serial killer. He's a serial date rapist with a rage problem. He killed 
in my opinion, we don't know yet, uh, but you know, Natalie, you took her on a date, I believe he tried to rape her, I believe he killed her in the process of raping her because she objected. That's a rage problem during a date rape. And I think the same thing he happened here, or the girl just objected to something else he said or did or whatever, who knows what sent him into the rage, but it's not premeditated. You know, he, he did not plan to kill this girl in his own hotel room and then have it all linked to him. If he had planned this like a serial killer, he would have put her in a vehicle, he would have driven out to a park or something and killed her out in a park and her body would have been found in the bushes but it was found in his own hotel room <laughs> that's not premeditated yeah. that's just I, stupidity and rage <laughs> I, i'm curious um and this can be partially supposition but how much do you think the timing of this played into it five years to the day of natalie holloway's disappearance well, it certainly is awfully peculiar that it's exactly that day. I mean, we have to look at that and say maybe there's something here. I think he could have had an emotional issue going on in the sense that he was angry at Natalie for what she got him into. In other words, he blames the victim. You know, that's the kind of thing these kind of guys do. A psychopath will always blame the victim. So I think on this day, he was remembering back to how Natalie did him wrong. And when he took this girl to his place and she did him wrong as well, I think that rage erupted. You know, I don't believe there are bodies all over the world that he's killed lots and lots and lots of women. I believe he might have raped lots of women, but I believe he, when he gets what he wants, he just goes on his way. But I think this girl, whatever mm. happened in there, that rage exploded because she was just like Natalie. Mm. Okay, Pat Brown, thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the issue of serial killer versus date rape guy with a rage problem. But before I do, I just, just, for, just for amusement, I'll, I'll play. I got to play this for you because it's just funny. Woo, chilling. Okay, crap Brown, Pat Brown. Thank you, Pat. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that was another show I did with Alex, and uh, she got she got to the end of the show, and she got criminal profiler and Pat Brown confused, and she said crap Brown, and oh my god, I had to go back on after the break, and I was like beating myself in the head and biting my tongue because I was laughing so hard I couldn't stop. And and I took this I took this video and I put it up on my on my YouTube channel at the time and some somebody wrote, well, she doesn't need to correct that. <laughs> and I wrote below it, thanks haters. You yeah. know, so <laughs> so some people do think I'm crap brown. But anyway, I thought that was really funny. So goes to show you how things can go wrong. Now let's talk about um the difference between a serial killer and and a date rapist and by the way there are some uh i, I just I'm, i have a video but i'm, I'm not going to show the video i just want to i just want to talk about uh what he, what happened with dr phil um dr phil had me on his show too and he, he was talking about uh that absolutely you know john van der a serial killer he, how many women does he have to kill to be a serial killer it's like you know he's killed two women already okay a serial killer is not just about how many people you kill. I will agree that in general, uh, the FBI used to have a terminology for serial killers. It had to be three women. And I'm always like, and you need three women? Why? I mean, how many women do you have to kill before you're you know, considered a serial killer? Because uh, that's a big line to cross. I mean, you don't just wake up one day and say, you know, I just want to try this one time. Let me let me go abduct a woman, rape and murder her just with a thrill of it. And if I like it, my, I might do it again. No, no, no. By the time you find one woman who has been abducted, raped and murdered like that, you already have a serial killer. One time, that kind of behavior, one time is enough. Now, you just when you find that one, you just know two things. Either you don't know the other crimes he's already committed, the other homicides he's already committed, or the homicide, or he just hasn't gotten to the second and third one yet. So in my opinion, I'm good with one. Uh, however, the methodology and the motivation is what makes you a serial killer. A serial killer is into power and control and the thrill of the kill. And the rape is what you do on the way to the murder. Because the rape is, rape is, uh, the rape is one method of power and control, and it also humiliates the woman. And you can have sex, too. So, you know, hey, you know, might as well throw it in. But the whole point is the actual killing. So there are there are serial murderers like uh, Son of Sam, David Berkowitz. He didn't rape the woman. And, and he actually said to one woman, hey, I'm not planning to rape you. I'm only going to kill you. Don't be so upset. You know, <laughs> he's a serial killer who never raped. But 
most serial killers do just because they like up close and personal. They like the, the entire process of getting to rape on the way to killing. They love strangling. It, you know, the whole thing is just cool to them. So the serial killer is premeditated. Now, when I say premeditated, it doesn't mean he planned to do it that exact day. He's always premeditating the crime. In other words, he's thinking about it all the time. It, it's a fantasy for him. He's not going to let go. So he might forever be on the lookout. And then one day a girl crosses his path. Let's say she gets off a bus bus, and he's like, dang, no one's around. And he grabs her, pulls her into an alley, rapes and murders her. He didn't premeditate it that day that that day he was going to kill somebody, but the premeditation is always in his head. So it might just you know, that may be the opportunity that presents itself. But the premeditation is the fantasy is I want to, I want to commit this horrific murder. I want to find somebody and I want to pop out of the darkness or abduct from, abduct this person, bring her to my basement and torture her and murder her. It's a whole process. Joran van der Sloot did not exhibit that. That is not what he's about. The, he, I see nothing in him that's really very well premeditated. And he has these two crimes. Now, with, with, with Natalie, he, he happened to run into her in the casino. They were drinking. She liked him. He's cute. And they went off. Uh, the Calpo brothers were with him. And I'm not going to get into the whole Calpo brothers. Are they, were they involved? Were they not involved? Blah, blah. No, I'm not going to get into that. I'm just talking about his behaviors. He ended up I absolutely believe he ended up alone on the beach with Natalie. Now, he wanted to do what he always wants to do with women, which is have sex with them. Uh, and he's always had sex with them. He's a big sex fiend, you know? He likes sex. And he's he was pretty good looking, and I guess he thought he was charming and all that crap. So women, girls did go to bed with him. They did have sex with him. And for a guy like that, if, you know, he's got this Natalie. I mean, she's already drinking and doing all those kind of things. She went with him to the beach. Maybe they kissed because let's, let's face it. I'm going to just be realistic. Although I say in this book, watch out for this kind of crap. Have I been there, done that when I was a teenager? Okay. My granddaughter might see this one day. So I never did anything like that. Never, never. Okay. Okay. But you know, you end up someplace, you meet this guy, you have had a few drinks, you know, yeah, a little bit happier than you should be a little bit more relaxed than you should be and the dude's cute and you think oh my god i might have met the guy you know and here's here's natalie she's celebrating she's in, she's in aruba for god's sakes the blue skies and the gorgeous beaches and and Jaron van der Sloot is not an ugly dude and he's also educated she meets him and you know you got this funny little thing that goes off in your head when you're a young young teen it's like bang, bang, bang. <sighs> great romance, love, maybe marriage, you know, whatever. And so she decides, oh my God, of course I'm going to go with him. I don't want him to get away from me. Uh, you know, we might, he might end up having this incredible romance, you know? So she goes to the beach and normally what happens on the beach when you go walking with somebody and you're talking with them and you kiss them a little bit, you don't think you're going to get raped and murdered. You think you're going to sit on the beach and chit chat and, and let's face it, for most people, that is what happens. Even as a teenager, you know, you might not even, you might not have sex. You just might be sitting there on the beach talking till five in the morning. Do you remember? Come on now. I want to say how many people remember this. You know, when you get older and you get married and you can't get your husband or wife, well, the husband will say, well, my wife will talk for hours. <laughs> but the woman will go, I can't get him to listen to me for five minutes. He's already bored and he falls asleep, you know. But do you remember the days when you could meet somebody, usually when you're a teen or when you're in college, and you could talk for hours and hours and hours on end, on end, like five, six hours straight. I don't know what the heck you talked about, but you could talk for hours. And so for Natalie to think she's going to sit on the beach with Mr. Handsome Joran van der Sloot, oh my God, and we're just going to talk and talk and talk the night away. Maybe we're going to kiss a little bit and hug and kiss some more. I'm sure that's all she thought was going to happen. But Joran van der Sloot, considering he's had sex for many, many years and thinks women are all hoes, and especially those American girls, now he starts pushing for a little bit more. 
and she might be she might be uh, a little little uh, tipsy. She might be drunk, but she probably wasn't unconscious. So we're not talking about the type of date rape where the girl's so unconscious she's like, oh man, is that dude on top of me? Oh, maybe he is. Oh my god, I don't know. Are we having sex? I'm not sure. Maybe we're having sex. <laughs> you know that happens, or maybe she's so completely out she wakes up and goes why am i naked you know i don't think that's what happened with natalie i think what happened with natalie that was that she was still conscious uh and he started putting the moves on and she started doing the no no i'm not i don't want to do that and he had expectations especially of the drunk american girl uh and she wouldn't cooperate now an interesting thing happens on a beach which is where i think I don't know that he killed her on purpose. Here is personally what I think happened. Beaches have sand. And if you're frustrated and you push the girl down in order to have sex face down, face down in the sand, in order to have sex with her, because you're trying to control her, and you push her into the sand, your face goes into the sand. He, he claims that she had some kind of seizure, uh, an unexpected seizure suddenly, and then she, she, she died. And then he had to do something about it. Uh, but I'm going to say he smothered her. He smothered her in the sand during a very aggressive sexual act. And then when he was finished doing what he wanted to do, he's like, Natalie? Ah, crap. Turns her over. She's dead. Now what the hell do you do? You got a dead girl. And, I, you know, as far as I know, he never killed anybody else. So that's not saying he's not a serial killer. I think he, this went, this was... You know, it went really badly for him because he he is a psychopath who wants what he wants and will take what he wants. And I'm not saying he's not a date rapist. I do believe he is that. Um, but both, here's a funny thing about, no, I don't want to say the word funny, but here's the thing about date rape. In reality, the majority of the time when the girl goes with the guy to his apartment, the girl goes with the guy to the hotel room, the girl goes with the guy to the beach. He gets sex because there is a, I don't, I, people, people want to deny this crap all the time. And it annoys me because in reality, there is a sort of an understanding that if you go to somebody's bedroom and get in the bed with them, you're, you're going to have sex with them. That's an understood. Not that you're going to get in bed. You're going to kiss. You're going to disrobe. He's going to fill you up all over. You're going to do some oral sex stuff. And, oh my God. He raped me because we had, we had, he did more than I wanted. You were totally naked in his bed, already having sexual activities. You know, and if he's really drunk off his butt, he may not be listening terribly well. You may not be expressing yourself terribly well. Things just sort of go in that direction. So there is an expectation. A lot of times when a guy takes a girl to a certain place and it's expectation on his side and her side that something's going to happen. Because he's a good looking dude, I'm going to guess that a good portion of the time, maybe most of the time, he just got sex. You don't have to rape people if they're already give you, giving you sex. You don't have to do it. So most of the time, he probably didn't rape anybody. He just had sex with them. Now, I'm not going to say he, he they had the sex that the girl wanted. Maybe he was too aggressive or he was, you know, overly, you know, not, not sensitive. I'm not going to get into how good he was in bed. I'm just simply saying that probably it was, you know, consensual. So he does, he has consensual, 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 consensual on the damn it. What about this girl? You know, she said, she had the gall to say no. I mean, all the other girls said yes. Why wouldn't she say yes to me? Oh, you know, she got drunk. She went to the beach. I mean, of course she's supposed to have sex. I mean, she knew that the contract was already there and then she doesn't do it. Yeah, right. So he goes ahead and he, gets what he thinks he came for. Um, and she objected and things did, you know, and she ended up being unfortunately a horrible vic a victim of a horrible crime. Um, now, what happened after that? Uh, I, I have a, a theory on that. Uh, some people think the Cowpo brothers helped him out. I, I don't think so because you're 17 years old. You just knocked off a girl you took to the beach. He is an entitled young man with a, with a father in high places. I'm going to say... He's calling daddy. He's going to call daddy up and he's going to say, daddy, 
this horrible thing happened. We were having sex. She turned over. I did. We, we were doing some more stuff. Oh my God. She smothered accidentally. And daddy does not want this to become public. He does not want this to destroy his career and his family or his son, even though, you know, his son is already a psycho and you should figure that out, buddy, and not help him out anymore. But okay, I'll help you out. So I don't think that without dad's help, he would have been able to hide her body well enough or, or you know, take her out into the sea or whatever to never be discovered. So I think he had help from a, not a higher power, <laughs> but a higher level of thinking than a 17 year old boy. So I'm going to go with that. So, so this is the first part of uh, Joran van der Sloot. I think his first one was an accidental, he killed her accidentally during mm -hmm. the actual rape. Now, um, going on from there, which is, which is really interesting, is of course we have five years pass. What happens with him in five? Oh, 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 wait a minute. Before I go on, I want to get rid of the stupid concept that um, Natalie Holloway was sold into sex slavery. Now, later on, it's true that, uh, you know, Joran van der Sloot was involved in some sex trade stuff in Thailand. But, you know, when you're in Thailand, there's a lot of very poor, desperate people there. It's not hard to sell people into slavery. As far as this goes, um, you, you know, really, you don't want to cause an international incident in order to get one blonde girl. And let me tell you how this works, because a lot of people don't understand this. You don't have to kidnap blonde young women to sell them into slavery. It's not the way it works. Here's what you do. You say to the young girl, you want to make some money? <laughs> you want to make some money? Do you want to make like $500 a night? $1,000 a night? Join our escort service. And every time you see an escort service, oh, come on, folks, that's a prostitution service. There's no such thing as an escort service. Escort service is a prostitution service. Only those are high, high class prostitutes. Generally speaking, they get more money for, for what they do. They go to hotel rooms and they stay for the night sometimes and get paid for the night, which is like a thousand bucks, or they maybe stay for a couple hours and get 500. Uh, they're not street corner girls. Um, there's also massage parlors. Uh, not only we see in the recently in, in the news, the Korean massage parlors where they tried to claim everybody who worked there actually gave a massage. Now Korean massage parlors um, 24 hours a day, they're not giving massages. <laughs> that's a sex. That's a that's a sex parlor, um, and they they would therefore have mostly Korean girls. And there is some sex slavery there because a lot of times what they'll do is bring in girls from Korea, China, those places, and promise them, you know, that they they will help them get settled in America and get a you know get a green card and all that. And then they'll pull their passports and say, if you don't cooperate, you'll never get your passport back. And that's a form of sex slavery. Blonde girls, no, no, no. They just go work in the, they work in regular massage parlors, which have all kinds of girls of different, you know, different whatever looks. Uh, they're, they're Americans. Nobody's, nobody's forcing them. They just go there and work and make a lot of money. Uh, and then they can join escort services and make even more money. And then some girls these days just do a lot of stuff with Craigslist and, you know, the, the, they do, they represent themselves and maybe they have a pimp that comes along for safety. Um, but, and then there is one more way, by the way, and this happens like in Japan, like they'll advertise, like come to Japan and be a hostess and they'll pay your ticket to Japan. And, and then you become a hostess. Well, some girls do fall for that because they're so excited. Oh, I'm going to go to Japan. I'm going to get to live in Japan. And then when they get there, they are in trouble, uh, but you don't have to kidnap them. You can lure them or you can just say, hey, you want to make some money? You've got homeless girls, drug addicts, people, so many blonde girls. You don't need to kidnap them off of the island of Aruba and hustle them down to Venezuela. So this is just nonsense. So anyway, let's move on to Stephanie Flores. I forget her name. Right? I, just, I always double check because I forget these things. Anyway, so he goes, he's on, he's going all over the world. So now he's down in Peru goes to a, a casino and he goes and finds Stephanie Flores. And let me, let me show you one of the, uh, the um, shows I did on that one. Cause, oh, I'm just specifically talking about Stephanie Flores. I'm going to play a little of my today show and then I will play a little bit of one I did with uh, uh, Joy Behar. And here's a, here's a speck of the today show. This is the one where, by the way, if you're of a certain age, whenever you see somebody on one of these shows, 
they look 20 years younger than they are because man, they have the, the Today Show has the best, best hair and makeup people. <laughs> Pat Brown is a criminal profiler and the author of The Profiler. Pat, good morning good to morning, you. Good morning, You've now heard his reported confession. He would probably say that it was coerced, but the line is, I didn't want to do it. The girl intruded into my private yeah. life. She made me do it, yeah. What does that tell you about his state of mind? Uh, well, I, I never trust when a psychopath makes a confession, because usually what that means is they're trapped. And in this case, we really see that he is. I mean, clearly the girl was murdered in his hotel room under his name, and clearly he's the only one that went in and out. So he knows that they're going to get him for a homicide. The question is, what homicide? And uh, usually what a psychopath does is he'll confess when you already got him cornered, you already know something, and then he'll tell you the minimum of what you know, and he'll minimize what he actually did. He'll give you the best story to get the best deal. So I don't, uh, you know, yes, he says he killed her, but I don't believe the circumstances in which he says he killed it. He's blaming her for looking on his computer, intruding into his life, and it's, he went crazy. Well, that will get him second-degree murder. He probably doesn't want to admit to possibly what he did, which could be first-degree murder. Well, you, last time you were on, this was before the confession, you, you said to me that you did not believe he was a serial killer, but he was right. a serial date rapist. date rapist with a right. rage problem. Do you still believe that? I do believe that because I think we've seen with his behaviors with Natalie Holloway, he took her to the beach. He didn't take her to the beach to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her. You know, guys take, go out with girls, take them to isolated locations to have sex with them. Uh, this girl also went to an isolated location. And I, any guy will tell you, yeah, like he brought her back to the hotel room so they could be friends. You know, Usually a guy has some intention of some sort. Uh, most guys will not rape, however. But he has already been, obviously one girl has gone missing under his care. Uh, my guess is that was during an attempted rape where she simply said no and he wanted what he wanted. And he obviously has a thing about sex. He was involved in a little bit of sex trade thing. So he has disrespect for women. So we see all the, the signs of it. But Pat, given the fact that, I mean, some reports say that, the, that Stephanie Flores was found in, in just her, her underpants Correct. and her shirt. But others say she was fully clothed. No evidence of sexual assault. So isn't it a possibility that he simply snapped? I don't believe in simply snapping. Okay. I want to stop there because it was interesting. When I first did that, when I first did that show, they claimed, the claim was by, by Duran is that she found out about, she went on his computer and she found out about Natalie, you know, and, and said something that offended him. So he beat, beat her to death. Um, you know, he's so proud of what he did, Natalie, what happened down there. I, I'm sure he would have just talked his way out of it. Come on, he's a psychopath and a pathological, pathological liar. He'd probably say to that girl, oh, come on now. You know, that, that, that you know, they never arrested me because it never, it never happened the way they said it did. I, 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 would, I dropped the girl off. I don't know what happened to her. And, and the worst that could happen is she'd leave the room. But that's not what happened. And, and one of the things that came out later, and this, I'm going to play a little piece of this, which came out later on, uh, I did on Joe, Joy Behar, because this is why I think, again, he went to have sex with her and she said no. So and Joe, Joy, yeah. Joy, I want to say something. Go ahead. Uh, just because we have this new evidence in, one of the things that's fascinating is that uh, he, Joran <laughs> actually said that he took her pants off and her shoes off after she was dead which of course makes no sense whatsoever. And we see a massive struggle here. And when we look at her pants, her pants have almost no blood on them. So you're gonna tell me that you got mad at her over some email thing and she got, you know, she, she punched at you so you, you went crazy and you, you hit her nose, blood going every place and hardly anything on her pants. This is gonna prove that Jordan is lying. He was attacking her. He took her pants and shoes off before she was dead. And obviously this is where the struggle came from. Mm. So I hope that they go for- Is that Joe? So, yeah. So I think what happened was they got back there and he's starting to put the moves on her and maybe she'd already taken her shoes off because, you know, she's just getting comfy. And he said, come on, you know, he's trying to take her pants off. She's like, no, 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 don't do that. And he pulls her pants off and then she's like, no, no, no. And she's stop. And then just like Natalie, only difference is you can't push her down in the sand. And the thing about sand is you can't fight back on sand. Then another place you can't fight back on is a water bed. You know, did you know that some uh, uh, prostitutes work in massage parlors? Is it very interesting? They can be raped because they use some of those use water beds. And when they're on the water bed and, you know, the guy hasn't paid them the extra money for you know more than a massage, the guy can push them down and they can't can't get any pressure to push up because the water it's a water bed. You can't get it. You, can, you can't fight back on it. So. The same thing is true in sand. You can't fight back very well on sand because sand is, it keeps moving and it gets, you know. So, but here we have Stephanie in a room and she's now fighting back, you know, probably full force. And then he just 
beats the living hell out of her and kills her. Um, so I honestly believe, again, we have no evidence of serial killer because no serial killer in the right mind is going to say, okay, I'm going to bring her back to my this hotel room, kill her, and then walk out in front of the camera. It, yeah, that's not a very good serial killer move. And this would not be the first girl he's killed, so he should be a little smarter by now. No, is a date rapist with a rage problem. And the importance in that is, is for the investigators and to how, not that he shouldn't get a death penalty or life in prison, regardless of whether he's a serial killer, a date rapist, or the rage problem, he killed two people. I don't care what his excuse is. But when you're doing investigations, you want to have an idea of how they behave so you know where to look to see if there's other crimes that they committed. I don't think we have to look across the world to find serial homicide crimes for Joran van der Sloot. Uh, that he raped a bunch of women is very possible. Um, but I don't think we're going to look at that. Now, could he have had another date rage, date rape rage problem? Possibly. So you might want to look for that. But he is not a serial killer. And, and I just want to get rid of that concept. Now, let's go to one other very interesting part of this whole, this whole thing. Um, this is where is Natalie's body and how the media just... It's just one of the most criminal things I've ever seen happen. And I'll, I've got a funny story to go with it. So listen to this. Let's bring in now criminal profiler Pat Brown, who's in Washington this morning. Pat, good morning. Good morning, Maggie. We've reported that, uh, this week that there's no death penalty, no life in prison in Peru mm -hmm. for murder. So a lot of people here in the U.S. feel that even if Van der Sloot is, is convicted of the murder there, he's going to get too light a sentence as it is. So here's my question. If Peruvian authorities feel they have such a strong case against him, why offer a plea deal that would reduce that sentence? Well, I don't know if that's really what's going to happen here, and I'm hoping the Peruvian authorities feel no need to do this. First of all, I've already heard that the Peruvian police don't believe he's going to tell anybody where Natalie really is because... Okay, that's the first part. He's not going to He's not going to tell anybody where she is because, for God's sakes, that would be stupid. And he, he um, and the Peruvians have no reason to let him go. They've already got him on a, on a homicide, a homicide of one of their own. And she was, you know, she her father was, you know, a well-liked guy. So... They want to put him away, and they did put. Like, he got 18 years, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but so what happened with her body? And this is a very interesting thing that happened, which I was appalled by. And this is why I have. This is why I speak up kind of strongly about the media, include, including uh, all the major major networks uh, and also the YouTube channels, because of abuse of victims and uh, uh, just milking things that it, w with lies. And listen to this. July 2005, racked with questions and few answers, Dave Holloway hired private investigator T.J. Ward, seen here in Oxygen's new series. I have a picture on my wall in my office of Natalie Holloway. I put it up when I got it in 2005, and it will remain there until the resolution of this case. Years later, that new lead. Dave got a phone call from an, uh, an individual who said that he had, had a roommate that started talking about Ron Vandersloot and said that they were running around together in 2010. He was telling me things that were not public. We did an 18-month undercover investigation. So you all start putting all this puzzle together, and I told Davis that something was there. A man named Gabriel had come forward and said, I'm living with this guy who says that he knows what Natalie's romance are. Do you believe the information he's told you? It's 100%. Cameras follow the winding and complex search. They encounter John Ludwig, who tells them something they've never heard before. Did he go with you to dig the remains out? Yes. Did you do something with the remains? Yeah. And what'd you do? Ludwig says that Vandersloot told him how he committed the crime. Later, Ludwig says he even helped him hide the remains, allegations that have not been confirmed by ABC News. Okay. They sure haven't been confirmed by ABC News. And do you know why they haven't been? Okay. Wow. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit more about Ludwig. Um, there's my little cute little picture of Ludwig go. Oh, I've lost Ludwig. You know, every time I do this, I always lose one picture and I don't understand why. Let's see if this is, nope, that's not it either. What happened to Ludwig? How about this one? Seriously, I can't find Ludwig. Where'd he go? I just put him up here. Anyway, Ludwig went missing. So, uh, <laughs> oh God, why do I have trouble with these things? Um, 
so I'm going to put this up here instead since I can't find Ludwig. Where did he go? I did. I did bring him up, but he vanished. Okay. So, all right. Let's let me tell you about this. This, this, uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the uh, private investigator ward. Many times I'll call people, private investigators, grifters, um, as well as other people who like to make money off of victims. Um, very frustrating to me. I worked a case once where the family hired this private in, pri private investigator. She they gave her twenty thousand dollars over time. Twenty thousand dollars, you know. And she came up with she was looking after this one guy. This is going to be the guy. It wasn't the guy, but you know, when you make fifty to a hundred dollars an hour, you're willing to look at just about anything. And 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 families who are desperate will pay sometimes that kind of money because they're so they think you you can basically say okay I'm going to look at this I'm going to investigate here I've got a good lead no the police do this for no money but when the private investigator says he's got a lead and he can look at this you got to pay him 50 to 100 dollars an hour to follow that lead and he can lead you down that little rose path and there's nothing at the end of it well ward led i believe uh, dave holloway down that path it, it was absolutely disgusting it was a Six part series. Now here's the other disgusting part. Six part series done by Oxygen Channel. And by the way, the last time I did a show on Oxygen Channel, I wanted to sue them too because they libeled me in it. Um, but in Beth Holloway filed a $35 million federal lawsuit against Oxygen and its production company, Brian Graydon Media. The network, according to the complaint, prayed and capitalized on Beth's desperate need and desire to find her daughter by falsely claiming to have found the teen's remains and persuading Holloway to provide DNA samples for testing. Now, this is what was so disgusting about it. It was a six-part series. They absolutely knew before the series ended that this was not true. That this, this guy, John Ludwig, um, who you heard at the end of the video, claimed that he these were human remains and he helped you know, do stuff with Natalie Holloway's body. And here, here's what he, actually he claimed. He claimed her remains had been buried in Aruba. And he said Van der Sloot paid him, or Van der Sloot paid him $1,500 to exhume the remains in 2010. Well, originally Van der Sloot and I discussed getting it cremated, but at that time it wasn't legal. But apparently some places would do it for pets. He told Ward, avoiding eye contact with a private investigator. Ludwig said that he and Van der Sloot spent hours crushing Holloway's bones and later burned her skull. Bone fragments were found in Aruba, later tested by a forensic scientist who was working with the producers of the documentary. Well, <laughs> look above you. No human remains found in the search for Holloway um, because they weren't. Um, Later, they reported that mitochondrial DNA bone sample did not did not match one provided by the teen's mother, Beth. Oh, you know why they didn't why they didn't match? Let me show you why they didn't match. Uh, is it this one? I'm gonna have trouble finding things again. This one? Yeah, there they are. Okay, that's why they didn't match. We found the remains, but they were found to be from animals. Hmm. Okay, so John Ludwig. Oh, here's my picture of him. I finally found the little bastard. Sorry, I have to call him that because he is one. Uh, so, so this guy, this guy, uh, this guy, uh, John, uh, John Ludwig. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, that thing up there, that thing. Um, I met him. I met him in a, the studio. I can't remember it was CNN or it was MSNBC. I don't remember where it was, but we were doing a show on Euron van der Sloot about this whole issue. We met, at, we were coming out and we were in the green room and he looks at me and says, hi, Pat Brown, I'm, I'm John Ludwig. And I went like this. And I said, I have no desire to shake your hand because you're as psychopathic as your little bastard buddy Joran van der Sloot, you're two of a kind. And he was, really? <laughs> he was like, mm -hmm. anyway, we walked out, we got in the elevator together, went down to the first floor and left. And when I saw later on that he, this, he was involved in this whole oxygen thing, I saw some, something he had said. So I had commented on my own Facebook page about this character. And he said, oh yeah, well, she's a big fat chicken because when we met at the networks, 
uh, she wouldn't get in the elevator with me. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I did get in the elevator with you, dude. I wasn't scared to be killing me in the elevator, you know? And so we had a little tussle on Facebook, but then just a little while back, there was this really sad news that he tried to kidnap a woman with a knife and she stabbed the crap out of him and he, well, he died in the, you know, in the, in the attempted kidnapping. That's a shame, isn't it? That's just a shame. <laughs> okay. Sometimes you just have to not be that upset about certain things. So anyway, he's not around anymore because uh, he, he, he was a psychopath. Like I said, he was a psychopath. What a creepy dude. Meanwhile, what's happening with your own slope? Okay, here's what happens in jail. This is, this is his bride. Yes, he's down in Peru. And some other narcissistic female who wants attention marries him. And of course, you know, I, I, I'm appalled by how many serial killers and non-serial killers like him, but killers, get to have the opportunity to marry in jail and uh, prison. Um, and this is very popular. I might do a, show, a whole show on this one day about how many women are perfectly willing to marry psychopathic killers because they have they have personality disorders and want attention themselves so he got married to this woman and you see oh my god you know oh look i gave you a picture of your one in my house isn't that sweet it's so sweet yes it is sweet and then guess what oh my god yeah look at our baby because i let him have sex in prison and have a baby so uh, so anyway he may be getting out at some point because he only he got 18 years and it's been oh, I forgot when I forgot when that actually happened, but it's been it's been a while so it's been years so he he may not be there much longer. He supposedly is going to have to come back to the United States and when he does that, uh, then he'll get nailed for uh, the 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 he tried to extort money from Beth Holloway. Uh, well, he did extort money from Beth Holloway to say I'll tell you where your daughter's body is if you give me money. So you know. Um, they're going to, they're probably going to get him for that uh, after he leaves prison. But how many years he's going to get on that? I do not know. So, well, you know, what a, what a, what a great guy. Uh, <laughs> so um, now I'm going to, now I'm going to finally get back to all your uh, comment commentaries. Um, yes. Uh, Cause I'm basically, uh, that's what I wanted to present today. I just really want you to know, not a serial killer. He's a date rapist with a rage problem, still a killer, still a psychopath, but, we want to be accurate about how we um, uh, how we label somebody so we can understand that for investigative purposes. Um, this is uh, Jacqueline says, did Natalie's mom date John Ramsey? I'm sure I read that somewhere. Yes, yeah, she did. She did. She did. She did. She did date him um, for a while, which is kind of creepy in my opinion, because I don't have a high opinion of John Ramsey. Um, and but, you know, again, they, they came together over the loss of their daughters um, and they did date. Um, but they have gone on their own ways. He's, he's married somebody else. So that's for sure. Um, urine is a demon. Well, you know, pretty much most psychopathic killers qualify as demons. They really, they really do. They qualify as demons. Um, let's see what else you have to say here. Uh, what? Oh, oh, that, oh, yeah. Okay. Here, Evelina, Evelina says girls who run from home. Yeah. I forgot to mention that one. Um, uh, Girls who run away, runaway girls uh, are picked up by chicken. I'm not sure what chicken hoax is who offer them a place to stay in a full fridge. And instead the girls sell themselves for him. So you can, so you can get a blonde girl. Yeah. You can get a blonde girl. She's correct. So there's a lot of kids who run away from home, especially as teens. They go to Hollywood and that doesn't work out well, or they, wherever they get off, on, they take a bus and, and pimps and their pim other, other people who bring, girls in for pimps will hang out at bus stations because they see the girl come off with her little luggage going, what, the, what, what do I do? Where do I go? And they go, you having a, you need a place to stay. And they're like, Oh, thank God, because they don't know where to go. And they're given a place to stay. And then they're groomed right into prostitution. And, and there's enough blondes to, to get into prostitution. And Hey, you know, if the girls are blonde enough, there's a thing called hair coloring. So you know, bleach, just make her blonde. You know, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to desperately seek a blonde girl who is going to start an international incident. You know, it's just, you know, you, you want to get away with crap. Um, ha, well, that's, oh, women date for romantic love, kisses as they walk on the beach, huggies, men date for sex. Well, I won't put it entirely that way, you know, but women are more romantic. This is true. They're more romantic. And so, and guys are more 
sexually oriented. So yeah, I mean, it's one of those rational things where you have to, to have to accept, you know, if you're going out on, on dates and going, you know, with guys into isolated places that they may have intentions uh, and hope, you know, that include sex. And um, if you're ready for sex, then everything goes well. If you're not, you, you know, and you get the wrong guy, you might have a, tr a, tr a chance. Oh, this is a question. Um, What's the chance urine drug Natalie and she had a seizure or died? Uh, some of that story makes sense. You know, there, there is a qu question of, you know, was it, were date rape drugs used? Uh, and therefore she did have a seizure. Um, yes, it's possible. So, you know, when you're an investigator and when I do these shows, there is no 100% proof until you've got evidence. So my personal viewpoint is because of his, his, his uh, methodology with Stephanie, um, I see Stephanie as a clear uh, a, a rape after she said no. That's that's my belief. He became enraged when she said no for sex. Um, and and it certainly it makes sense that the same thing could have happened with Natalie. Uh, did she have a seizure because... She gave her some drugs. I mean, it's possible. And then you could think, oh, my God, I gave her that stuff and she she OD'd on it, essentially, or seized, seized out on it. So I got to do something about it. It is possible. Um, I don't I don't I don't take away that one. Um, but regardless, then he if he gave her the drugs for the purpose of having sex, then he that's straight up rape right there, because, you, you know, you never give drugs for a girl so you can go have a conversation. <laughs> you know? Oh, I hope she I hope she's going to have a nice chat with me. <laughs> I want to loosen her up for some nice talk, <laughs> you know? So that's, pre that's premeditated rape issues right there. So regardless, it's an attempted rape or a rape. So one way or the other, it's, that's what it is. So, but could it have happened? A absolutely. It could have happened. Um, oh, let me look at this one. Mark, they sound like extreme and narcissist. We have this, yes, and I want to I want to point that out to you. Um, oh, I didn't put it up here. No, yes, uh, psychopathy. I, I always look at the continuum. If if you're healthy, you're 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 well, you shouldn't. Well, you're in the middle. You're healthy, and then you go up here to narcissism because you're like you got too much. Yeah, you know, let me put it this way: we all have self interest. You know, sometimes people will call you a narcissist simply because you want something for yourself. Yeah, everybody wants something for your, for themselves. Um, grandiose thinking. Sometimes you'll be accused of grandiose thinking. I've been accused of grandiose thinking. How, you know, you just think, I'm like, I just had big thinking. <laughs> big thinking means I want to accomplish something in the world. I want to I want to do something good. That's not grandiose. It's big thinking. A grandiose thinking is when you say, you know, I, 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 was, in, uh, I was in Desert Storm and, and I was in, you know, you know, I was a, uh, you may, you tell these stories where you're some kind of, you know, incredible hero or you're a spy. I'm a spy, you know? Okay. You're really huge. And really what you are is a box boy. You know, when you start making stories of about how you are these huge things and you're not, that's really grandiose thinking. Some people, some people, you know, people say, oh, you have grandiose thinking. Well, you know, it's because you're the governor of the state, you know? <laughs> You're a million billionaire. Is that grandiose thinking or is it just you, you know, you did what you said you would do. Um, so narcissist self-interest is okay. I mean, we have to have self-interest. We have to care about ourselves, but we also have to care about other people. We have to have empathy for others as we do for ourselves. Theoretically, if we're healthy, we wouldn't do terrible things to other people in order to gain for ourselves. We would be fair. That's, that's healthy. Then you get to narcissism where pretty much, you're concerned about you and you and you. Um, and so you'll, you, you'll manipulate or you'll, you'll, you'll do things to get everything to be your way. And a very difficult person to live with people who are narcissists. And then when you get to the end of the, the scale, you're a total psychopathy. And that's what I pointed out with your on Van der Sloot. Let me, let me show you a, um, uh, let me show you a, my, my, my quick take on psychopathy. This is, this is, this is an easier way to think of psychopathy with, rather than a psychopathy checklist, which is excellent, by the way. Um, Doctor, uh, that was Robert Hare. He wrote the psychopathy checklist you just saw. Excellent. But here's why I put, simply put, if you know someone who is a manipulative, pathological liar, 
who thinks he's entitled to everything and doesn't care what happens to anyone else, an arrogant, lying SOB who is always trying to snow you, then you have a psychopath in your life. And, and I like that because it's, it's you know, and, and if you actually look at that and think to yourself, is that what's in my life? And a lot of times it is what's in your life and you better, better run away from that. If you have a child that's like that and starts early on doing all of those things, it's very, very concerning. So, yeah. So psychopath, he, there's no question your environment suit slope is an absolute 100%. Really, really great example of a psychopath. They really, really are. Let's see what we have here. Uh, Evelina says, my sister is traveling alone. I've warned her several times. She is a pretty blonde type, very attractive to men. I hope she comes home safe and sound. Uh, let me point out something with that. Um, I also have traveled alone many times in my life. I've traveled around the world alone. Um, and what I, I, I should write this book one day. I keep planning to it. Uh, basically, how to travel alone as a woman. The, 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 the rule I use is always stay with women and children. Now, when you're 19 years old, that is not what you want to do. But if you stay with women and children, you're pretty safe uh, because nothing is happening there. You're not uh, basically you're not getting drunk in a bar. You're not walking down a scary, dark street at night. You're not going off with some guy. You're with women and children. So you can see the sights. You can go go to theater. You can do all kinds of things because you're with women and children. If you're going to be away from women and children, you want to be very, very cautious about where you are going who you're going with and how you are leaving that place uh, so that you don't get yourself in trouble. Uh, and, and so many, it's so sad. So some pe pe kid, uh, uh, girls are out in countries and, and they go drinking and then they get, you know, they, they call an Uber or they, they just walk out and get a, get a, um, a cab on the street and they're never seen again. And, and it could happen in the U S too. It's just, you know, you're very, very vulnerable that way. Um, in certain countries, for example, if you travel by train as a female, they'll have an all-female car, which is very, very nice to take if you're alone. Um, so you have to just very, very much be careful and make good choices. And I should write a book on that one of these days. So what drugs do rapists use? Rehypnol. I mean, that's the basic one. Uh, Helen, rehypnol, uh, that's just basically uh, the date rape drug of choice because you just get really really, you know, your brain just shuts down really quickly and you become very, you know, and you can pretty much, you can't remember anything. However, my opinion, it's shots. It's absolutely shot after shot after shot. That has become a scourge in our society because girls get so drunk so quickly because, you know, a guy, people never look at this. A guy is 250 pounds and he can take shots. A girl is 115 pounds. She cannot do the same amount of shots he can. So the old drink him under the table or drink her under the table, you know, he can drink her under the table really quick. Uh, and so, and then because shots are done, so sometimes they'll do like four shots in like 20 minutes. So, you know, that nursing, that nursing the, uh, the Tom Collins, I'm going to nurse the Tom Collins all evening long. No, you're not nursing Tom Collins. You're drinking an actual alcoholic drink. You might be drinking a martini or you might be drinking a, a whatever you're drinking. And then you have the shot with it. So you're drinking two things at once and they're mixing alcohol as well. And you just get drunk really damn quick. And, and that's what I think is really doing. And a lot of the girls are just getting really drunk really quick. And then they just have no control left. And it, it's really, really sad. Um, so you don't really need date rape drugs. Just need to get them drunk on shots, you know? Oh, <laughs> hi, Rebecca. Uh, hi, Pat. Love your work. Would love to see you do a show on Darley Routier. I never, is it Routier or Routier? Routier, I think. Oh, my God. Not the Innocence Project. Oh, Lord God. I hear the Innocence Project is involved now. Holy crap. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. I will do, I will definitely do a show on Darley. Um, and I will, I've been wanting to do a thing on the Innocence Project as well because, <sighs> The Innocence Project is not so innocent. They're interested in, in the death penalty mostly, uh, getting people off of the death penalty. They have a lot of college students who are very anti-prosecution and cops. So they're looking for mostly technical, technical stuff that gets people off. A good portion of the people the Innocence Project gets off, in my opinion, I'm going to say in my opinion, so they're assuming, in my opinion, they're guilty as hell of the crime they committed. And then they come out of prison after 20 years and they say, oh, I don't blame anybody. I love everybody. I'm like, yeah, because you're guilty. And nobody knows better. And then he make, the guy gets like $10 million in you know, compensation. And if you actually look back at the actual 
details of his, the crimes, he's like, whoa, that evidence was really strong against that dude. But the Innocence Project got him off on something. Darley, they're hooking. Oh, I did not know they're messing around with Darley now. I will do one on Darley. She's an interesting little character. And she's got a huge fan club now, too. I think she found, I think she found Christ. So she's got a, she's got a, a fan club. Isn't that lovely? Okay. Uh, let me see. Oh, oh, okay. I'm going to point this out. Just saw your post. I'm not fond of Dr. Phil either. Oh my God. Um, I find it interesting. Beth married John Ramsey. Uh, I, I was talking about, I, I was going to show the Dr. Drew clip, but I decided not to, but just the funny thing about it was Dr. Drew used to have me on all the time and he'd go, okay, Pat, I know you're going to say the guy's a psychopath. That was his lead line. I want. Well, yeah, because you're always asking me about psychopaths. And in this case, I he, he thought that Jan van der Sloot was a serial killer, and I said he wasn't. We had our little tussle over that. But I would just want to tell you, I like Dr. Drew. He's always very kind, always very fair. Dr. Phil, I did his show one time. I find him a total grifter. I find him completely uh, victimizing victims. Um, he, he, uh, I, I went, when I did his show, his behavior before, during, and after the show was appalling. And I, I refuse to ever do a show with him ever again. They did call me to do other shows. And I told them straight up, I said, I will never do a show with that man again. Uh, I don't like him. And, uh, but you know, apparently he's very popular. <laughs> so, and I, I, you know, as far as, as far as Beth marrying John Ramsey, I say, I think John Ramsey can be, he's a very controlling, very, he can probably, he's a very, you know, he's can be convincing. So, you know, that's the way it works sometimes. Um, and let's see, let me, let me roll down to the bottom now and see what else we have here. Okay. Um, oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, that's nice. Rats rule. Oh, do you have rats? I just want to know if you have rats because I love rats. Um, I've had rats. Um, uh, <laughs> Hi, Pat. Just arrived at this live stream. I want to say I love the work you do. You're always very fat, fair and balanced. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm really here to help people understand, as I point out over and over again, I'm not here to solve crimes. We really don't do that. We think we, you know, people think they're solving crimes and everybody's into true crime. And I'm going to we're going to solve it and we'll call the police in with all our thoughts and the police go, please don't. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, there are times when tips are really useful. There's times when tips are just not, not, not helpful at all. Um, and so my, my, my idea is to educate on, uh, and to, you know, and somebody said, well, you're entertaining. I'm like, well, I hope so. Cause I don't want to bore you to death either. So, but I want you to just, I'm just here to help people understand things. And I'm, I do it kind of my way. Um, and some guy wrote me the other day, <laughs> this is because you have ADHD and you're not comfortable on camera. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I talk fast. I'm from like Northern New Jersey and I've been on camera for 20 years. So that's not the problem, but you know, I am sitting at my dining table, you know, so, you know, I, and I'm doing this entirely live and, you know, there's no editing here. So you, know, you get what you get, but I like to, I'm really having a good time. I, I have to admit that. Um, I just love having you guys here. I found it very hard to do any kind of uh, YouTube without an, without people here because it feels so kind of like you're talking to dead space. And this is nice because I know you're here and that's kind of exciting. Um, oh, that's an, who's this? Maura Murray. Can you put, oh, so, oh, let me remind you below. We got comments. Please do comment. I try to, I try to discuss things with people when they put things in the comments. Uh, if you have questions, I will try to answer them until it gets to be so many. I can't find you. Um, but, um, also, please do put the names of anybody you want me to look look at for cases. I have, my list is getting really long now, but I, I think I might be here for a while. So I'm going to try to, to address a lot of the cases you're interested in. Uh, so the disappearance of Maura Murray, I don't remember that one, but you're saying so much lying and BS from oxygen. You know, I, I honestly do not know what's happening to to these, these, these networks. Um, I don't know. I, that's why I quit TV. It wasn't like this before. It really wasn't. Um, I've had I had many good experiences over the years working with all the networks. I've done over three thousand television appearances. I've done quite a few documentaries. I had a good time until I forgot when I forgot when it all started going downhill. But I started getting the 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 the, the um, t uh, network started going toward 
agendas instead of just let, you know having experts on to speak. The documentaries were definitely heavily on here. We're gonna this is our agenda, and then they they lie to you about why you're coming on, and then they they libel you and and or slander you. You know, it's it's just horror. It became so horrific. I just said, yeah. So I did oxygen. My last one on oxygen. You can look it up. I did an oxygen one on uh, um, Martha Moxley. They edited the living crap out of me so that I looked like a moron because I left out the evidence I was presenting and then I was basically trashed. Um, and, and it was really sad because, you know, they called me up and said, oh, my God, we really love you. We want you to do this because, you know, we know your opinions on this case. And, you know, and that was the last that was the last documentary I did. Does that mean I'll never do one again? No, I will. But I, there's going to be one ironclad contract. I will never just do it like I used to, which is just basically like, you know, you say, okay, you got to pay me something. They never want to pay you anything. They're like, oh, we, we'll give you lunch. I'm like, yeah, I can get lunch down the street. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing this for nothing. You're making money. So I'd have to fight for that. And most of the time I lost because they could find people who do it for free. But if they paid me at least for my time, I would look forward to doing it because it's very interesting to do these cases and discuss these things. But now, now it's just not worth it because you know, there's no amount of money worth being uh, slandered. And so unless I can have an ironclad contract that, you know, uh, they're not going to be able to do that to me, I won't do any. And Oxygen Channel, I think that was the last one I did because I'm, I'm at Martha Moxley, but whew, just terrible. Uh, very frustrating. Um, so, okay. What you're saying? Uh, there is an agenda. I love Martha Moxley, mom. Okay, I'm not sure there, but... Uh, in, in case I, I will do something on Martha Moxie one day for myself, um, I have the very unpopular opinion that uh, um, I forgot his name. Jesus, <laughs> what's his name? The guy who said they killed him. Okay, I'm just blanking now. <laughs> oh, the Kennedy cousin. Uh, wow, I'm just I've just lost it. Somebody tell me the Kennedy cousin. Who did they say killed Martha Moxie? Went to prison for ten years. It was God. I did the show. I did the show. Well, anyway, I don't think he did it. Uh, and I actually analyzed the entire crime scene. And it's absolute like there's just almost no way he could have committed that crime, including the fact he had a solid alibi. So, um, God, I, why am I blanking on his name? Somebody tell me his name. Jesus, it's going to drive me crazy. Uh, but, um, but he, you know, he got out of prison finally. And he's supposed to. Oh, my, thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank God almighty. Michael Skakel. <laughs> thank you. Um, Michael Skakel. Um, and, you know, people hated Michael Skakel because he was was a Kennedy and he was, you know, you know, here's the thing. When you're analyzing crime, you got to make sure you don't allow yourself to be swayed whether you like somebody or not. Michael Skakel said some things that made him very unlikable. You know, he really did. It's like, oh, don't do. Don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. Um but that doesn't mean he committed the crime. And so you still have to look at evidence. And, and I'm going to do one on that. I'll do a whole show on uh, Martha Moxley. And this time, it won't be edited because it'll be my show. I forgot about doing that, but I'm going to do that one. So uh, <laughs> says Kennedy family, that's good enough. Yeah. But, but, you know, um, I, I, you know. I, 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 yeah, he, I, don't, I don't believe he committed the crime. So, you know, and it's just, you know, people are like, they're appalled because they, 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 it seems so, oh, well, we don't like the dude. He was, he said creepy things. It's got to be him. And we want justice for Martha Moxley. Well, of course you want justice for Martha Moxley. And when I do the show, you'll see what I think, the person I think really did it and and why I think that, and why I think the evidence is 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 that direction. And 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 that's uh, Michael Skakel should not have been convicted. So, um, oh, aren't you nice? Aw, Love your show, Pat. I think you're well-spoken, witty, down-to-earth, and especially informative. Sometimes I mumble and forget what I'm saying, but, you know. I'll be, I, I'll, I'd be here every Sunday. I meant, I'll be here every Sunday. I mentioned Elizabeth Short, DeSalvo, Ed Kemper. Oh, yeah, you know. Wow, we got so many to do. Oh, what am I going to do? I have one for Sunday. Now, theoretically, um, I'm going to be vacationing with my granddaughter and my daughter and we're coming back Sunday, but I don't know if we're going to get back in time. So depending on what, what the, what the statement is on that, whether we're going to be uh, uh, back in time to do live, if I can do that, I will do live. But if I can't, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a show on um, uh, Rodney Alcala. 
the dating game killer. Um, this is one of, when I did a, um, some commentary on him years ago, uh, it was one of the most popular, one of my highest number of you know, views were on the Rod, Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer on the shows I talked about him. Well, he just died in prison. Now, this, this is what's crazy. He's on death row. He dies at 77. I mean, really? I mean, can you not knock the guy off before he dies on his own? I mean, you know, what's the point of this? Why don't you just make it life in prison if you're never going to kill the dude? You know, uh, so, you know, 77, pretty long time. But the reason I want to do something with Rodney Alcala is that, you know, the majority of serial killers aren't all that exciting and interesting. Their crimes are very simple. They jump out of bushes, whack you on the head, rape you, strangle you, you're dead. Um, they're not very interesting. Rodney Alcala was one of those rare ones that was much more creative in his, his, his entire spree of, of, of uh, homicides. And so he is very interesting. And he appeared on the dating game and women went out with him. And it's just so creepy. I mean, and the dude is creepy as hell. I'm like, who the? And they thought, they, they thought he was creepy. They thought he was creepy in the green room. So, I mean, like, who went out with the dude? So, um, so I will do next week will be uh, Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer. It'll either be live or it'll be taped if I simply can't make it back in time to do live. Or I could do live later. I could do live, live at five o'clock maybe. Hmm. Maybe I'll do a five. Maybe I'll do an evening one just so that I'll be back. That maybe that may be what I'll do. I may, may just do it later in the evening. Maybe at seven o'clock, and I can get back from. Because we're probably going to, you know, get up. We have a three-hour drive, so maybe we'll get up and have a little breakfast and do something, and then we'll drive back. So maybe not to be pressured. I'll just do a seven o'clocker. Is that okay with everybody? Can you come at seven? <laughs> and if you can't, it'll be it'll be taped. But I do enjoy doing them live. So if I can do them live, I. Kind of prefer that, so I'm going to do that. Um, let me see what anybody else says. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, this is a good one. Alcala was, Hanana says Alcala was so creepy. The date that picked him couldn't stand to be near him in person. <laughs> he was that, literally that creepy. Christine, I'll be there if it's later next Sunday. Okay, uh, I think I will try to make it uh, later next Sunday. Um, so I'll try to do that. So. Um, Oh, yeah. Oh, and then she refused to go on the date because she was too creeped out. That's exactly true. I mean, it's just, it's a really bizarre, a bizarre case. Oh, thank you. Have a nice vacation. Yeah, it's going to be a very short one because we just, after, after we, after we tried to figure out um, where to go in the summer, everything was like, the, the flights were crazy and the hotels were crazy. So we just said, oh, the heck with it. We're just going to throw my, our granddaughter in the car, my granddaughter in the car. And we're just going to drive and we're going to do some historical stuff and um, just have a fun little uh, three day driving fun trip. So my, uh, grandma, mother and daughter, That's like, <laughs> the three of us, yeah, the three of us. OK, so I will be doing that. So I'm looking forward to uh, next week. Uh, so I will. I think I will schedule for seven o'clock in the evening in that way. Um, I can still do a live one um, and I'll do Rodney Alcala and we'll talk about serial killers and different types of serial killers and why Rodney Alcala is kind of an unusual one um, because he was, he was definitely an unusual one. So, you know, that he suddenly died. I was 77 though. Can't get over that. I really freaking can't get over that. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you know how much money we spent on that creep? keeping him alive for all those years, you know, and then you do, you go through all of those appeals and appeals and appeals. It's not like he didn't kill all the women. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not like it's a question whether he did it. The Innocence Project didn't even bother with Rodney on Cali. You know what I mean? There was just no way they can't even get around it because, okay, the guy's so super guilty. Yeah, we'd look pretty stupid if we went and tried to get him out of prison. Although I think they're going to try with it. maybe Scott Peterson. They're trying to get his butt out of prison. So, you know, I mean, it's amazing. So, <laughs> but I do look, I do look forward to seeing you all next week. And um, yeah, it's been fun to be here today. And uh, one of the things, anything I want to say, oh yeah, just again, just to, just a reminder, because I always forget again, please do, please do subscribe. Um, I'm trying to keep this channel going. It's, it's doing very well. Um, but I, I, I really enjoy it and I want to put more time into it and I want to put the profiling school together in it and I want to keep it to be something where um, it, it's, it, it can sustain itself. So obviously, obviously advertising does help sustain it. And interesting enough, um, because I talk about murder, 
especially child murder and kidnapping, they they put a kibosh on some of the videos. So you have you get these different things. Like you get you like get a green uh, dollar sign when it's all cool, and then they give you a yellow sign. The yellow dollar sign says limited, and then you can get a red one which says forget it. So if you were doing something about let's say dogs, uh, you know, you get a ton. You know, everything would be green because you're talking about doggies. And then you could you could get, you know, uh, advertisers want you to you know, sell their products online. Um, and, and you know, but, you know, I'm doing homicide. So what happens is the advertising is very limited because of that situation. Uh, so that, that that's that caused a problem. I probably will uh, start a Patreon account just so we can I can get some support for this channel um, and do, you know, uh, that's, you know, so I can do that. I will never do super chat because I will never beg you for money during the show and suck that out of you. That just makes me kind of throw up. So I won't do that. <laughs> and, you know, and I hope to be able to provide good content and especially the, you know, the profiling school stuff. I would like to start that and have it be there for anybody who wants to learn about profiling and crime scene analysis, especially students who are, you know, although, you know, I have to say most of, most of, most of, a lot of my people coming here are heavily uh, ladies in like the 40 to 70 groups. So I don't know how many of your students are profiling and want to join or want to join the police force, but I hope to reach out to everybody as far as helping them understand um, criminal profiling and crime scene analysis and how the police work and, and how to think things through rationally as opposed to, you know, just, you know, oh, it's so exciting, you know, it's, you know, very much, we, there's a thing called murdertainment and it's a really tricky place to not be on the side of murdertainment um, because people say, well, Pat, you're, you're talking about murder too. So you're making some money out of it too. So you're doing murdertainment, you know, and so th there is an issue there. And so on one hand, we want to provide information. On the other hand, we don't want to make it such that we're just, you're making, some people are just making a fortune off of horrific, sad, sad things, uh, you know, where vi people have been victimized and brutalized and, and somebody's making a million. Um, it's just kind of sad. So, so when, so when oxygen does a six part series to say they're going to find, uh, cause this creepo, creepo John Ludwig claims that he's, he knows where her bones are, you know, uh, Natalie's bones are that to me is just absolute. It's criminal. It's absolutely criminal. And she, they should be sued. And I'm glad she sued them. I don't know if she won the, uh, the lawsuit, but I think she should, uh, the mother should sue them for that. Uh, Beth Holloway should sue them. Um, but that, that, that's, that's where I call it murdertainment because you're not even leaning on the side of uh, being truthful and honest and trying to bring, you know, we all want to learn things. We all want to do, we do want to know the news. We do want to know what's happening. We want to understand the world, but there's a limit. And then I'm, I'm trying to stick with that. <laughs> so um, I will, I will try to be as good as I can on that. And you can call me out if I'm not. So anyway, look forward to you next week. We'll talk about Rodney Alcala. Bye. Bye. See you next week.